Well, it's official. Pope Francis has announced that the current problem in the Catholic Church is non-acceptance of Vatican II. I'm joined today with Michael Matt, who is the godfather of the traditional movement, the old guard. And we're going to go through what Pope Francis said today and uh, just try to figure this out. Is, is non-acceptance of Vatican II the current problem? in the Catholic Church. Michael, Matt, welcome. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Taylor? Pleasure I'm well. to be here. You, uh, you, you're you back from France. We're going to talk about that later in the week. We'll do another show together. But uh, Chart was a big success, I saw. Big success. A little jet lag. So if I doze off, you'll understand. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're going to begin with a prayer, but uh, we're going to look at this uh, this new claim by Francis that everything going on in the Catholic Church in the last five to ten years, uh, non-acceptance of Vatican II. According to him, that's the problem. Before we get into it, we're going to pray the Our Father together. Oremus in nomine Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, Sanctificetur nomen Tuum, Advenia Regnum Tuum, Fiat Voluntas Tua, Sicut in Cielo et in Terra, Panum Nostrum Quotidianum da Nobis Odie, et emite Nobis Debita Nostra, Dicut et Nos Dimitimus Debitoribus Nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentazione, delibera nos amato. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritu Divinus. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Real quick, uh, Michael, I can hear my voice coming back over. Uh, is there a way to turn down maybe your audio just a little bit? What do you think? Is that? Yeah, how's that? Oh, how about is that any better? Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Uh, it's barely there, but I think it's a lot better. I think we can work with that. Okay. Okay, so Francis. He says, here's the quote. The current problem in the church is precisely the non-acceptance of the Second Vatican Council. Michael Matt, what do you say? Is that the problem? What's he talking about? <laughs> no. I mean, once and for all, would he define what it is about Vatican II that we are supposed to accept as faithful Catholics? You know, is there is there some new dogma defined in the council that we're supposedly rejecting? And if it's not dogmatic, then what are we talking about? Just the spirit of, of the council? Apparently, that's what he's talking about. And that would be the same spirit, by the way, that Pope Benedict, his predecessor, said ushered in an age of, of disintegration in the church, where monasteries and convents closed and people lost track. A crisis, he said. The spirit, the council of the media that Benedict said. So this is, to me, it's just absolutely absurd that he comes out and says, he's basically saying, whatever I say the council means is what you must accept in order to be a faithful Catholic. Apparently, Taylor, I'm not sure. But the fact that he will not define what it is that we're supposed to accept or what we're rejecting about Vatican II, to me, that's the story. What is it, holiness? Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I cast my gaze, you know, over the church and I see, you know, that raw deal in China that Francis pursued. I see the Theodore McCarrick aftermath scandal. I see almost all the German bishops allowing, promoting same-sex blessing unions. Uh, massive hemorrhaging of young people, decline in vocations, religious orders. I mean, you and I, we, I mean, any layperson could create a, a punch list of 12 items of serious problems in the Catholic Church. And apparently the biggest problem is there's people who want to go to the traditional Latin Mass as it was celebrated for well over a millennia, millennium, centuries and centuries. And then you raised the great question is, well, what is the dogma in Vatican II that is infallible that we must assent to with faith? Where is that list? What is it? And it's never come. It never has. It never has. And we have popes now who have, who have spoken with great concern about the fact the council has been used, whether it be by the media or by the, by the, by the, uh, the progressives, to do something other than what the council fathers intended. Ergo... For him to just say Vatican II, the rejection of Vatican II, he's not telling us. And I think the lack of specificity is what the modernism, ex what modernists excel at, and it's very intentional. You don't get to ask what I'm talking about, what specifically we're talking about when we say Vatican II. Just do what we say. And of course, 
the tacit admission then is that this is a massive new church, a new religion with new liturgies and new catechisms and new evangelizations that are in conflict with the past. Benedict tried to explain unsuccessfully where the hermeneutic of continuity was between the past and the present because he needed to be to, to set that council in line with tradition in order to make it just, justify it. That never happened. So I think Francis, if anything, he should be out there telling us exactly what he means by this. Otherwise, it's a meaningless thing to do. And it's the statement of a dictator. Just do what I say. I define things, even though I'm not defining them. I'm the one that gets to say what you must accept and what you, you cannot reject, even though I don't define that. And so you have confusion everywhere now. And all the other thing, Taylor, is so much, so it's so important. We've talked about this before. We learned the teachings as traditional Catholics. Uh, speaking for myself, you called me the the you know the old pioneer, whatever the the old the old traditional. The, the, the dawn, the, the dawn. Yeah, I'm pr I'm pretty old. So <laughs> so I learned all of this stuff that supposedly puts me in conflict with the modern Vatican. Do you know where I learned it? I learned it in diocesan Catholic schools. So all those nuns, all those priests. My parents spent a lot of money as you know educating us in Catholic schools. That's where we learned all of this. So Francis is basically indicting all of those good priests and nuns from the night, you know, before the revolution really took off, who were teaching the faith. All we're doing is accepting what we were taught under pain of mortal sin. As confirmed Catholics, you cannot reject any of this. You must be prepared to die rather than deny it. And now Francis is saying, well, you're rejecting Vatican II by doing that. And that's a huge problem. This is a scandal. It's a scandal of unprecedented proportions for him to speak like this. Yeah. Here's, here's more of the quote. Restorationism has come on the scene to gag the council. The number of restorationist groups, for example, there are many in the United States, is staggering. An Argentine bishop told me that he had been asked to administer a diocese that had fallen into the hands of these restorers. They had never accepted the council. There are ideas, behaviors that arise from a restorationism that basically did not accept the council. The problem is precisely this, that in some contexts, the council has not yet been accepted. It is also true that it takes a century for a council to take root. We still have 40 years to take root then. So he's using this term restorers. Yeah. Now, I remember Pope Pius X, he wanted to restore all things in Christ. I thought that's what we were about as Catholics. But mm -hmm. apparently now that's bad. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he's saying. But, but but again, I, I keep thinking Francis is so concerned about us that this is really, really good news. You know, if they were in control, they're in the driver's seat, they got everything made, why would they keep going back and mentioning us? And I think your viewers, my viewers, uh, really need to take heart here. We are under their skin and we're in their heads right now, Taylor. That's exactly where we want to be. And we're there because of fidelity to the faith and fidelity to Christ the King and the Blessed Mother. That type of thing is making them crazy. They thought they had crushed it. They hadn't crushed it. And they're, they're, I'm sorry, but the, the Pope is basically freaking out over this small and strong vocal minority of traditional Catholics, which every day is getting stronger and stronger, thanks to him, and more united than any. Francis is the great unifier. He is unifying a, a much broader section of Catholics now who have kept it's what is happening in the Vatican. So I, I take great comfort from this on the one hand that, yeah, they, they're very concerned. And I'm very pleased and very honored that he specifically cites the United States of America as being a problem, a source of problems for, for the agenda. Yeah. And he's not using, I think it's interesting, he doesn't use the word traditionalist or traditional. Uh, he, he doesn't want to grant that title. Why do you think that is? Why does he use rigid and now restorationist? Well, I read the thing really quickly, but I think down towards the end, he does finally tell us what he's talking about. I think he uses the word traditionalist. I could I could be wrong. Well, the article yeah, I'm reading wants... does have traditionalist in quotes that I'm seeing, but I'm not seeing in the context. So maybe he did say traditionalist. Maybe the version you saw has it there. I'm not seeing it, but maybe. I think what he, wa what he wants to avoid is the great quote from St. Pius X, where he said, the traditionalists are the friends of the people, not the revolutionaries. Traditionalists are what? Traditionalists are, are folks who are just adhering to one of the twin pillars of, of our faith, tradition and scripture. If he uses that too much, a lot of people, when they're looking at the chaos in the church right now, are going to obviously say, 
What's wrong with tradition? Why, why, why is he opposed to people who are adhering to the traditions of his own church? That doesn't make sense. So in typical modernist fashion, come up with some new nomenclature. Let's call them rigorous. Let's call them extremists. Let's call them haters, whatever it takes, rather than. And this is where I think you're, you know, our, our, all of us, your, your viewers can take such comfort because we're not inventing anything new here. We're not starting anything new here. We are simply believing, living out the faith as it was handed down to us from our fathers and our obligation before God, not men, is to hand that faith down to our sons and daughters. So we're not, we, we don't, the, the old expression, you're more, more Catholic than the Pope. Well, that happens to be true right now, but that's because Francis is simply deviating. I would ask your viewers, what is Francis more concerned about? Abortion, apostasy, some of these really big issues of the day, or climate change? You know the answer to that. Yeah, what does he talk about all the time? It's climate change. And those of us who are still talking about the things that the Catholic Church is all about, especially death, judgment, heaven, and hell, we're rigorous, we're bad, we must be ignored. I think it's because we pose a threat. I honestly do. I think we pose a threat because they know that ultimately ours is a culture of life. The traditionalist Catholic viewpoint is creates a culture of life, and everything is going wrong for them in this culture of globalist death that Francis unfortunately has allied himself with. Yeah. Do you think that the obviously he's following what's going on in the United States? There are some loud, prominent voices amongst the priest, amongst the laity, growing, expanding the traditional Latin mass, the traditional movement. Is, is it something about the American ethos or is it because we have more disposable income? Why is it that the United States has so many traditional Latin masses? Are we a rebellious people? <laughs> what is it? Well, we started in a rebellion. That's that's true. But I think you know most of us are grandsons now, granddaughters of, of Catholic immigrants who you know that was very important to the immigrants. I know in my case, German and Irish, it was very important to preserve the cultural heritage that had come from the old world, and that was like this with Catholicism. So that meant preserving Catholicism as well. And I think it's it's it, it has something to do with that. But also, I think it has to do with this idea that that Americans have the reputation for thinking on their own. I wish they would think more independently right now because I think we're at a low point when it comes to that. But it's the same with the Second Amendment crowd or you know the, the, those who are uh, defending our civil liberties and our freedom and property ownership and the right to defend ourselves and the right to you know to, to, to have guns to, to protect our, our, our hearth and home. That creates psychologically, a re a not, not rebellious, but an independent spirit that is being crushed everywhere right now. So if you look in Europe, I just came back from Europe. They've been living in, in uh, under the, the jackbooted, you know, the, the, the heel of socialism for a long time. So even Western European countries are very used to being told what to do, where to go, what lines to step into and stay there and keep your keep yourself, especially since the EU came in. So I think it's very important for all of us to understand that as Americans, we have much more freedom. We have a culture of freedom. We also have much more freedom even still to speak, and we are speaking. And I think it's so important right now when you see the globalist agenda sort of beginning to stumble right now. I don't know for how long, but they've got problems right now implementing this great reset. Americans have got to lead the charge. I'm talking about now American in general. And when it comes to the stumbling that's going on in the Vatican, with Francis having officially jumped the shark and having alienated huge swaths of Catholics, you know, you turn all the way over to Marshall, that's a huge group of people now who see something very wrong in the Vatican. We as American traditional Catholics have an obligation before God, before our children, and before history to become more outspoken right now than we've ever been, to stand up and fight, to seize this opportunity of weakness. And we know they're weak because even Francis is pixelated, is freaking out over us because we're still speaking out. This is a grace from God. It's a gift from God. But it comes with, I think, a pretty serious obligation to get off our duffs stand up and fight and make your voices heard. And you might be surprised by how many people are going to be wide open to, the, to, that, to that message that we as American traditionalists have the luxury right now of being able to present. Yeah. When you consider that, you know, I remember interviewing you a couple of years ago and you said in the early days, like with your, your parents and in the 70s and in the 80s, you know, it wasn't the case that you had a traditional Latin mass in every city in America. Right now you do pretty much, pretty much. Back then, 
not so much. But even still, it's pretty small. We're talking one, two, three chapels per city in America. I know it's different in other countries. But listen to what Pope Francis says here. He says, the number of restorationist groups, for example, there are many in the United States, is staggering. I read that and I thought, okay, well, there's SSPX and Fraternity of St. Peter and Institute of Christ the King and a few monastic groups and there's some Sede Vicantis, but I don't see the number of groups as being staggering. It's pretty, it doesn't take long to to get your bearings in the traditional movement of who's who and where's where, right? What's he talking about here? I, I think he's talking about a spirit that's taking fire. And I guess I would cite as an example, you mentioned the early days of traditional Catholicism and everywhere, you know, my father, you know, later on me when I came to the remnant, everywhere we went, we were like on defense and trying to defend the traditionalist position that we had. I don't know about you, but I find it just the opposite now. I can walk into conservative Novus Ordo parishes, which I just did yesterday, last Sunday, the priest after mass at hates. I see your stuff, you know, on, on uh, your remnant TV stuff, and it's great that you're here. This isn't some pious the tenth guy. This is a regular diocesan priest. So, so I, I think that that now there's this sense because people are not only seeing a theological problem or a liturgical problem in the church. Now they're realizing the more the church the church recedes and reduces, the less defense they have, and the more this whole secularist, godless, globalist juggernaut has just free and an easy open season access on all of us. So it's not difficult to win recruits. And I think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact there are there are lots of us, considering most people now are in a lot of people. I would say most people are simply simply abandoning religion. And here you have this 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 fire inside the furnace, you know, in the United States is, in terms of religion, in the United States and France and in England, that's just burning and it's alive and it's got vocations and young families and big families. And if you're an old crotchety globalists sitting over there thinking you're going to win your little revolution and shut the church down forever, and you know anything about history, you're afraid. And that seems like a lot of people to you who are not, who have not been deceived, we've not been seduced, we've not been deceived, and now we're ticked. Now we're ticked off, and we're going to war, and Francis knows it. So I think, again, this is great news for us. We need to accept it in humility and as a grace from God. But it's also a, a, a wonderful and powerful challenge and much more encouraging, much easier to get involved in this fight than it was, as you say, in the early 1970s when it looked like they had won. And they were ignoring us completely by, at, at that point, by the way. Right. So this kind of thing comes into play with Traditions Custodis. That seemed to be a big smackdown, and it was a big smackdown. It's a total reversal of Samorum Pontificum. The outcry was loud. The outcry was universal. There were even Novus Ordo bishops and clergy in the outcry pushed back. And it seemed to me that Archbishop Roche had to back down and Francis had to back down. And instead of going after the right, which they still are. I mean, when I was in Paris, I was in Paris before you were. They said there were 15 Latin masses in Paris. Since Traditions Custodia, there are now five. So they are definitely trimming the tree. Mm -hmm. That being said, so many more people, I think, are sympathetic to the traditional movement because they see what a mess the Pontificate of Francis is and whatever he's against, people are like, well, maybe we should look into that a little bit. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. right. He simply is not, and this is on him, he's not been convincing as a spiritual leader on any level. No. He's always talking about the social issues that you can get from Klaus Schwab, Joe Biden, Bill Gates. They're all saying the same thing. thing. And so if you are in a spiritual pursuit, you're looking for truth, you're looking for spiritual you know, fulfillment. Francis is very political. He's just all emerging spiritual leader who's standing up against the demons who are obviously have a demonic agenda. We know that, whether it's transhumanism or abortion or contraception or population control. It's a very scary agenda. And people looked to the Catholic Church, whether they liked it or not, they found some comfort there, that there was this huge bulwark of defense against a very worldly and dangerous uh, secular movement. So, yeah, I think I think that um, a lot, lot of people now, I'm, I'm so surprised how many bishops in this country are basically ignoring Traditionalis Custodis, how many former neo-Catholic figureheads, I'm not going to name them, but I mean, you know who I'm talking about, big name guys at universities and with huge conversion stories and all of this who are extremely friendly 
to traditional Catholicism. And if this goes much further, and I don't think it's going to, I think we're talking about months, not years, we're going to see even more big voices. Thank God, guys like Raymond Arroyo are already mm -hmm. saying more than they ever, we ever thought they would. But I think we're going to see some people of extreme influence saying, okay, now I have to, I have to follow that angel of light. I have to follow scripture. What's coming out of, out of the Vatican is in contradiction to that. And if I, I tell you what, if I were Francis, I would be nervous. I really would. I think his agenda is getting more and di more difficult to, to push. And there's more and more people worldwide who are becoming extremely tired of him and, and very suspicious of his connection with the Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum and all of that. Yeah, I agree, especially what you're saying about the Protestants. I mean, I know tons of Protestants. I was a Protestant minister before becoming a Catholic. I think people trust me and want to talk to me if they're coming from a Protestant background. And I've even today, I was at a coffee shop before I came on came on to do this show, and I was talking to someone. They said, "Oh, you're you're a Catholic." I said, "Yeah." They well, where do you go to church? I said, "Well, I go to the traditional Latin mass." And she lit up and said, "I used to go to that with my grandparents," you know. Mm -hmm. And there's, I think there's something where people kind of know something's wrong or shameful or embarrassing about the current mainstream diocesan whatever is going on. You know what they've experienced. And yeah. to hear, well, yeah, I, 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 you know, I have my my problems with Pope Francis. Like, oh, you're not a global communist? No, I'm not. <laughs> I don't. I don't agree with Francis. I mean, right. you actually get their yeah. ear. They yeah. perk up. They're exactly like, oh, right. wait, you believe in the Trinity? Uh, you believe that Jesus Christ made blood atonement for sins? You yeah. believe in the forgiveness of sins, heaven and hell? Yeah, I believe in all that and more. Yeah, that's that's intriguing to the Protestant. It is. And right now, you don't have that impasse as far as, oh, Catholics don't worship the Pope. Oh, Catholics don't think that the Pope is right. Jesus. All of those things are becoming very obvious as we, by definition, or as, as part of our obligation as Catholics, we have to be more critical of him. It's become, the, pap the theology of the papacy is, become, papacy is being being clarified, I think. And then you, you mentioned you know, the grandmother thing, I think, in that, in that same report. First of all, he spends a couple of years, Francis, showing very little concern for grandmothers and grandfathers who are dying in nursing homes without the rights, without the last right. rights, without confession. I didn't hear him say anything about that. And then just last week, was it? I was in France when it happened, but he comes out and starts ripping the clothing of grandmothers, like he age, she's shaming them, doing a little age shaming. They're they're wearing lace no, still. He, yeah, I think you know, well, he like, said priests like priest, shouldn't but, be wearing grandma's lace. What? what this is a this is an international this is a globalist figure how do why why do you not think about how insulting that could be first of all and how myopic it is for this i'm well, sorry yeah but this it insults old traditionalist priests but it also insults grandmas and grandmas right and he's out of touch because i don't know a lot of grandmas that wear lace anymore so again he shows his own <laughs> age and out of touchness and uh and let's face it the priests are wearing lace it's a lot better than the moo moo things that the novice are wearing that no one can right. even define the polyester the, fabric, the polyester know? shower curtains that they wear on the altar you know it's horrible the caftan and moon on yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> okay so here's another one and i think it goes back so here's getting into the council and I, I kind of started seeing this a couple years ago where, OK, they're going to start attacking the traditional Latin mass as sort of the flag. And honestly, it is the flag. You know, mm -hmm. we traditionalists and back to America, I think part of it, America was never Catholic. Right. We never had a, a King St. Louis the ninth. We're not Poland. We're not right. Italy. We don't have national monuments of Christ and Our Lady. We have none of that. So for the American Catholic, our identity as a Catholic had nothing to do with the state, nothing to do with culture. It had to do with your local parish, your mass, your church, your local people. That was Catholicism for us. So when they yeah. came in with a wrecking ball and changed the mass, changed the architecture, dissolved communities, that really, I think, pierced the heart of the American Catholic because we had nothing left to fall back on. Absolutely. That's what we had. And so I think the antennas went up on on Catholic Americans and they said, wait, they're taking the mass. That's the only connection we have with historic Catholicism. We don't have beautiful cathedrals. Some places right. we have the mass. And and that might that might be the key reason why there's so such a strong current of traditionalism in America. But it all I goes back to the council. And this uh, I mean, Michael, Matt, this is my concern for the current traditional movement. Yes, there's growth. Yes, there's union in places. But the debate over the council, do you reject all of it? Vigano. Line item vetoes? Bishop Schneider. I mean, I don't want to simplify, oversimplify. Bishop Schneider. 
Is it pastoral, not infallible? We are coming closer and closer, and Francis is pushing us closer and closer to that cliff and saying, do you accept the council? Do you not accept the council? And if you don't accept the council, we're going to take away your final little treat, your little cookie, no more Latin mass, no more traditional baptisms, confirmations, whatever. You just lost it. It's your fault, not ours. Sorry. Do you think that's yeah. where we're going? I do. And that's why I think it's very important as we, at the top of the show, we start off by putting the onus on them. You tell us what you're talking about, because this is very unclear at the moment. And we've made this point before. If you want to like comfort those who are new to our, to your show, my show, here's the thing. Here's the, the, the bald facts on this. We accept more of Vatican II than Father Jimmy Martin does. You know what I mean? I mean, we accept anything that's that's doctrinally binding, that was doctrinally binding on our parents right. and all the Catholics back to Peter. We accept to whatever extent it shows up in Vatican II, we must assent. Like Vatican to that. II says Mary is the mediatrix. I agree to that. you you agree to that. Would sure, James Martin sure. agree to that? Right. Exactly I right. I don't know. Yeah, exactly right. So, so we accept whatever we want, whatever one must accept. Because remember, John or Pope John the Twenty Third, when he called this thing, he wasn't addressing a problem. In fact, he just the opposite. He was talking about those prophets of doom who are always talking about something wrong in the church. So he he basically confirmed for us, Taylor. He's saying everything is great. Everything mm -hmm. is great in the Catholic Church. We're just going to have this council to make things even more better and we get more outreach to people who don't understand. So, ergo, there was not a problem that that council was addressing by the pope who called it by his own word. So now we're saying we're, we're left to say what is it about Vatican II do you think that we're rejecting? You need to specify, because in fact, we accept all that is doctrinally binding that happens to make its way into the 16 documents of Vatican II. And the only thing that we may, may or may not reject is the novelty that bishops and popes have ever since said is up for some debate. Whatever's new in the council, some like collegiality or ecumenism or whatever, all, none of that is doctrinally binding. All of it is subject to debate. A Catholic can reject it in good conscience. So Francis must remain mute about this, quiet about what he's talking about, because if he specifies, he loses, and he knows it. So he leaves it ambiguous. Yeah, as soon as he specifies, he brings out the yellow highlighter and highlights all these sections that are going to mm -hmm. be debated and uh, that are the controversial passages. Yes, he just yes. wants everyone to sort of, you know, just roll over and accept it. Right. Right. And, and, and the thing is that the documents of Vatican II, most Catholics haven't even read it. I would wager to say many, many traditionalists have not bothered to slog through it. And, and, and what they're talking about is the revolutionary event. There's a reason they don't define it. The it's the, the event that mattered, the whole sea change that mattered. Benedict got close to it talking about it. Personally, I think that the answer for traditional Catholics just look them dead in the eye and say, you tell me what you're talking about. You prove that I reject anything doctrinally binding in Vatican II. Over and above that, I am not interested in your hippie Woodstock Council anymore. I'm done with it. That was like my grandfather's era. We're, right. we're, we're done with whatever the Vatican II Woodstock thing yeah. is that y'all love so much. It's irrelevant to us and to our children. I think we put the onus back on them. You tell us exactly what you're talking exactly. about, and then we'll talk. Did you see, I, I did a show on it yesterday, did you see in Chicago and Pentecost, the cool in the gang mass? I don't think so. What well, is they it? had, uh, they're like, let's shake it. And it's like, celebrate good times, come on. And they're all dancing. and all, you, haven't, you haven't seen this shot? Oh, oh my goodness. Friends. It's in Blaise Supich's diocese. And then a guy comes out in the sermon and he has the big bubble wand with the giant bubbles. Saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the same, Matt. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. It's just, I think it's the same priest also who did the guitar benediction thing. Right? So in Chicago, yes. you can have bubbles. You can have cool in the gang. You can do blessings with, cig uh, with, cigar, uh, with guitars. But yes. uh, you probably could use a cigar for incense, actually, if you want to do that. Right. But you can't. Right. You cannot celebrate the mass that was celebrated in every church in that diocese in 1960. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Don't and you, know you what, dare. Exactly. One thing I did notice, somebody sent me the bubble clip when I was in Paris yeah. at the pilgrimage. And uh, when I looked at the at the uh, congregation, it's all white hair. Yeah. They, they got no they got no future. Kids, young people, to see through the absurdity of some idiot up there, 
you know, trying to out Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons or whatever. And in this case, he was in his bubble. Uh, this is not effective for for kids. <laughs> it's only effective if you happen to get out of the nursing and, and home. And what's crazy is everyone's and going to church that day. Ah, clapping. It's like, come on. It's one of the dumb bubble ones. They do this at a kid's birthday party uh, hundreds of times every Saturday in America. This is not. Yeah. Ugh. Unbelievable. It's, but it's, what's what's sad about it is it's almost like they're burying the church. It reminds me of Biden. You know, that he, it's all on purpose. They're trying to phase out the executive branch of the government by putting this foolish old man up there. I, I sometimes think liturgically in a, in a diocese, an archdiocese like Chicago, they're doing the same thing. They're just driving the church into the ground. They don't care that it's not. It has no future. That's fine with them. They want it out of the way. You know. Yeah. That's judgmental on my part. I could be dead wrong, but that's the hunch. I can't imagine that the ineptitude is their alternative. They would be that inept as far as how to generate interest in the liturgy in Chicago. Man, that's pathetic. All right, there's one more part here. It's at the very end, and I think this is the most... He's trying to be cute. He's trying to be winsome, but it's the most defeatist thing that he says. He says, It is also true that it takes a century for a council to take root. We still have 40 years to make it take root, end quote. To me, that's a defeat. He's saying there's these staggering numbers or not accepting the councils. It's 60 years, six decades, and they're still having to fight these traditionalists and stamp out the Latin yeah. mass. Yeah. He's, ad he's admitting a major failure here. Absolutely. On Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He is. No doubt about it. And especially, once again, especially since the council didn't address any outright heresy. It wasn't called to address a certain problem in the church. So in those cases where you had to have a longer time after during the Arian heresy or whatever to or after Trent to sort of unpack the definitions that were brought in to fight the heresy, it would have taken a little longer. But there really is no need for this to take any time. No doctrine was defined at Vatican II. So he's basically saying all the you know, all, all the, the the bells and whistles and, and the happy thoughts, clowns and everything that was going on at Vatican II. Nobody cared. Everybody moved on. And now they're going back to what works. Yep. And he's really upset about that. So he's got 40 more years to convince us that this is what we want. And obviously, all indicators at the moment are nobody wants it. If you're under 70 years old, you don't want it. You don't want it. Don't want it. Well, and you think, OK, so uh, Council of Nicaea was AD 325. The next council was uh, Constantinople 381. All right, so that's about 60 years. Man, they had Arianism smacked down in, by 381. Yeah. I mean, there was some decades there in the 350s where things were looking pretty rough. But, you know, they, they brought it to a close, and that was on the very heart of Christianity. Is Christ fully God and consubstantial with the Father? Right. What are we even talking about with Vatican II? What are too? we talking about? Exactly. And don't forget also, they would have been, you know, they would have been disseminating the information from the Council Fathers, you know, after those early councils, right. probably on horseback, maybe on foot. Yeah. It was much Letters. more difficult. Now we have the internet. You can find out what's happening immediately. And we already see how ineffective they are. They, I was at the, the Synod on the Sex Scandal. I was at the Amazon Synod. Yeah. You know, what happened out of the, as a result of that? Who got the word? Who cares? Nobody. Nobody's interested in them unpacking the bags of their little their little shindigs in Rome that that really weren't that meaningful to anybody anyway. Yeah. Even like with the synod on synodality, and they're making a big deal out of listening. Nobody cares. So we participation really need is more. so small. The numbers they're putting out are mm -hmm. so small. You know, like you'll have a diocese of a million people, and it's just like maybe a thousand or a few thousand people participating. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's not. No one cares. Yeah. It's 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 so I I think for him to suggest that we still need forty years uh, to figure this thing out, especially after what Benedict said back in twenty or in twenty thirteen, that this was just a crisis that came out of the council, and that we need to figure out what went wrong at the council. It, uh, it's on there. It's on them to try to figure this out. All we know is we got chaos. We got empty pre empty churches, empty seminaries, abusive priests, a massive sex scandal. Since Vatican II, especially, not only, there were problems before, but especially since Vatican II, and he needs 40 more years to have Vatican II save the day. This is disingenuous. This is, this is a revolutionary who's aging, and he realizes it's not, what, it's not taking off like he had hoped, and he's getting desperate. Praise God yeah. for that. And he doesn't have 40 years. Yeah. So now yeah. we'll see what happens in the next conclave. He's got that stacked. Yeah.
but but you know we have we have supernatural the supernatural gift of hope yep. lots of things happen think of Pius the ninth and, and popes that were intended to be liberal placeholders or liberal pontificates and 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 the Holy Ghost intervened the church is getting toward the bottom now as far as its ability to come back humanly speaking who knows I've been hearing some pretty I don't want to I don't want to push this any any more than what it is. Just rumors out of Rome that there is, and I'm sure you've heard them too, there is a strong sense that, that many of the cardinals are beginning to gradually, finally, thank God, beginning to wake up to this thing. Because right. uh, it's not going to help them either. The church is becoming so sort of uh, degraded, if you will. There isn't a lot of pomp and circumstances left. There's not a lot of excitement about being a Catholic bishop anyway let alone if at the end of the synod on synodality, if you take the biblical approach to sodomy, you might end up in jail as a Catholic bishop. You might find bishops saying, in self-defense, let's see if we can't find a Catholic guy <laughs> to, exactly. to become the next pope. And not you know? Francis 2.0, which would be right. a disaster. Exactly right. All right. Well, great. Thanks for your commentary. And uh, we're going to be back later in this week. We're going to talk about the success of the pilgrimage to Chartres. How many people came? 20,000 this year, walkers. 20,000 people. The yeah. pictures were amazing. I, I mean, my, my soul was warmed just looking at all the young people, all the priests. How many priests? Uh, there was a little bit of a discrepancy there. I think somewhere, obviously, it was between 250 and 300. I'm not sure what the final Beautiful. count was, but a lot of them. Beautiful. Yeah. So we'll be back yeah. to talk about that. And and when I interview you on the on the Chartres pilgrimage, we're going to talk a lot about. I want to get your perspective on the growth of the younger demographic, Very both good. in vocations in the priesthood, but also the young people participating in traditional pilgrimages like the one uh, in Chartres. I think people will be really encouraged to yeah, find out that, I sure am. Th that yeah. there's a new page turning. Yeah. Okay. And things, things are getting better. Don't get, don't despair. Don't get discouraged. There's some really beautiful things happening. And that's like you said, we have the supernatural virtue of hope. So uh, make sure that you subscribe to this channel, Dr. Taylor Marshall, and you hit the bell. So you'll be notified when uh, Michael, Matt and I come back. Uh, later this week and uh, also make sure you subscribe to remnant it's remnant video now right remnant newspaper.com is probably the way you'll catch most okay. most everything but you're yeah. are you on you're on youtube right uh, we're on youtube as well yeah remnant where video you can exactly be. right yeah where you can we're, be uh, yeah we're building our, our alternative but right. yeah run youtube is fine yeah good and that's linked b below the show as well so make sure you check out uh, michael there we'll close up with uh, a hail mary and we will Pray this Hail Mary for the restoration of all things in Christ, which was the motto of St. Pius X. Oremos. Nomini Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pronobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. St. Pius X, pray for, for us. us. Nomini Patris et Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Make sure you pray your rosary every day or you're not on the team. Find a traditional Latin mass. Go to confession every two to four weeks. Live the normative Catholic traditional lifestyle and come to know Jesus. Be saved. Michael, Matt, thanks for being on. And until next time, Amen. remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely.